So we're all standing up on the, on the surface like this, we're, we're fighting against gravity at all times. Uh, if we, if we uh, stop reacting and balancing on the, on, our, on the Earth, then we will fall over. It's such sort a of fundamental feature that we're constantly fighting. And in fact, many of our reflexes are set up to make sure that we don't fall over, that we're stable. And the problem with that is that sometimes we don't want to be stable, we want to be able to, to move around. So you have to overcome the stability that your reflexes have all set up in order to be able to do. Here are some people who failed in this task. This is from a picture from Ray Donovan television series. And you can tell immediately which people are alive in that picture and which ones have, have become uh, full of, have failed in their fight against gravity. You can immediately tell that because their reflexes are no longer working. And in fact, if I'm, if I'm walking, I have to overcome these reflexes. So walking is really a constant act of falling and, and recovering yourself. So that's a fundamental thing. And we're perceiving our world from a particular viewpoint, partly as I've said on the earth, but also because our eyes are a certain distance above the ground, and so the world looks uh, according to the geometry depending on whereabouts you are, another source of, con of context. And a, a smaller animal would not have quite the same context there. They're seeing the world from a lower down place, and their perceptions are de determined by how they're positioned in the world. It's all to do with context. So when we're doing our perception, we're doing it not just in, in, in the lab, through our eyes and so forth, but in the context of our whole uh, existence. And how do we know about this? Well, we've got some senses. We've got uh, information from the soles of our feet, the pressure that we're experiencing, or in your case, on your bum, so if you're sitting on the chair there, that's, that's telling you about what your orientation is. And you've also got a special organ inside your inner ear called the vestibular system, which is also telling you a little bit about uh, where gravity is coming from and any accelerations that you might, that you might have. It took a long time to decide that this sense, the vestibular sense, was even a real sense at all. Because our sense of standing still, moving around where gravity is, can also become, uh, be told to you by other senses as well. And it wasn't until 1914 that Robert Barony got the Nobel Prize for demonstrating that this really was its own special sense. The each simplest Nobel Prize ever. It just squirted cold water in the ears and indicated that that produced set certain sensations, thus indicating that this was a, a special sense, an, an, an additional sense. So inside our ears, we've got the vestibular system, it's actually joined together, the, 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 the structure of the, of the sense organ is very closely connected to the hearing part of our ear, but it's quite separate, there are evolutionary reasons as to why they're similar. And it's, uh, you can feel it in, your, in yourself. You just feel your, your skull just behind your ear, you'll notice a little swelling that you've never noticed before, just behind your ears. And that swelling there is called the bulla, and it's inside there uh, that your vestibular system is, uh, is sitting. So it's divided up into these two parts, one that tells you about accelerations, and that's called the otoliths. The otoliths are ear stones, and those little circles here are supposed to represent stones sitting on, on hairs. And when you accelerate, they tend to stay where they are, and so they bend their hairs and tell you about your acceleration. So they tell you about your movement. But they will also be stimulated by gravity as well. So they will be, uh, as I'm moving around here, they're giving me both signals at once. So I need to try and separate those two signals out. The other part of the uh, system is the rotation system with the canals, and they're, they're telling me about angular movements of my, of my head as well. Now, it used to be, in the days of Robert Barony, it used to be thought that it was only... Oh, I'm sure that's going to work. Um, hang on, I'm just going to go back for a second. I was, I was warned that this uh, automatic device only goes one way. Okay, there we go. Uh, it used to be thought that it was responsible only for reflexes, such as the reflex I've told you about where you don't fall over, the vestibulospinal. Uh, 
Um, but a, a, another one was the vestibular ocular reflex, how the vestibular system and your eyes are connected together. So I've done a very simple demonstration here. If you simply hold your hand out in front of you and just move it up and down a little bit, and keep moving faster and faster until you can only just make out the details on your hand. Just looking to see the, the, the palm lines on your hand, right? You can't move it very fast before they go all blurry, right? Now keep your hand still and move your head up and down by about the same amount. And what you'll notice is that you're able to see those, those lines on your hand very, very clearly. And that's because your vestibular system is actually controlling your eyes and keeping them nice and stable in a way that they're not able to do on their own when you just move from this your world around. Here's another example of the, of the reflex. <laughs> okay, so what, what's happening there? Well, the reason I'm showing show you this movie is to show how the, the system is designed to keep everything still. So as you move the, as the, as the person moves the chicken's body around, his head stays remarkably still in space. This is true for humans as well. You can pick up your friend and move them around, and their head will tend to stay extremely stable, except, of course, you run out of neck. It's more impressive on a, on a chicken or a ostrich or something cool like that. But uh, it works on humans as well. When you see people driving motorbikes around the corner, they tend to keep their head upright and stable during the, during the, the movement. So these reflexes uh, all work uh, to produce this stability. But, as I hinted at earlier on, it's ambiguous. Your oculists are just giving you this one signal. They're just telling you that acceleration is happening in this direction. And you don't know how much of that is due to gravity and how much of that is due to your own personal acceleration. So you've got one arrow and it's got multiple possible interpretations. I've drawn out two of them here. It could be a person with that or the other one. There's an infinite number of possibilities. So from a single acceleration with two origins, there's an infinite number possibilities. So how do you know what's, what's happening? It could be that we are right now uh, traveling upwards, accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared, zooming up. But instead, we decided that we will interpret this signal as actually being stable. And the reason that we think it's stable is because we can see the world around us, which tells us that we're not zooming upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. So we need vision in order to help the vestibular signals. Now vision on its own can actually produce a sensation of motion. You might have experienced this uh, in a, in a theatre where you have the, the, a helicopter flying over a cliff or something like that and it gives you this sensation that you're, that you're moving along. Uh, this, this is called an optic flow, the motion of the, of the world past you and it gives you a lot of information. First of all it tells you you're not in fact accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters second square, but also it can tell you about your, the, the speed at which you're moving forwards and the direction in which you're moving as well. So it's able to disambiguate, to make it uh, much clearer what that vestibular signal is doing. Now a place that you, uh, when, you when you're traveling around, you might have noticed this experience, but when you're going out to somewhere, it seems quite a long way. When you're coming up to York, if you're not regularly at York, you might have noticed that it seems like, oh, so far out of town. But when you go back, you'll find out that it's actually, it seems much shorter. You probably experienced that, you go out to somewhere new and then you come back, it seems quite different distances, even though, of course, they're the same distance. And we've got a nice model that will explain uh, why, those, uh, why those two things work. We can simply uh, calculate the uh, perceived distance and show that it's never exactly right, uh, but there's errors in those two directions depending on what your actual task is. So, what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that you need to have this context in which you uh, exist in order to be able to use your sensory uh, information. So this is coming, if you're relating it all to your own body, because that's what's doing the seeing, doing the perceiving and so forth. But, how do you know it's your own body? Well, an easy way to check is to just look at parts of your body and tell them to wiggle around and see if they do it. 
So you just look at your finger, move your finger, mm -hmm. that's my finger, that's moving around, I'm totally identified with that finger. So what we can do in the lab, of course, is start messing around with that. Uh, we can give you a view of your finger, but instead of giving you an actual view, we put it on a screen so that we're able to add a delay into the movement. So when you make a movement, you see the screen, you see the uh, uh, movement on the, on the picture happening a, a very short while later. We can figure out how much later we need to do that in order for you to be able to tell that there's a delay. And we can compare that with that very same finger, but up the other way. So this looks like somebody else's hand, you see. And so we can compare how much time you need in order to be able to tell it's your hand in the two situations. And what we get is a self-advantage. You're better at detecting a delay when it's your own finger that you're actually looking at in its normal configuration, rather than what you interpret as somebody else's finger. So it's a quantitative measure of assessing that it's yours. If you've got the self-advantage, then that shows us that it is yours, and if you don't, then that indicates that you're not so keen on having it as part of your own body. And then, we can mess around with the vestibular system. So we can pass electrical current into the bulla that I've just introduced you to behind your ears. Here's our winning victim being uh, electrocuted in this way. Uh, you only need a very small amount of current, of course, just, uh, just a couple of um, batteries, that sort of thing, nothing very serious. But we put in a disruptive signal and that temporarily disrupts your, your sensations coming from the vestibular system. And when we do that, the self-advantage disappears. You become less associated with your own body. So it's telling you that the vestibular system is not only controlling all these reflexes, not only telling you about your movement in space and so forth, but also enabling you to identify your, your own body. So how much gravity do you need to stimulate this, this organ, this wonderful system in your, in your ears? Well, we need to be able to manipulate gravity. So what we do is use a centrifuge this case, human centrifuge. So the person lies on the, on, the, uh, on the bed and gets turned around and that produces a simulated g-force uh, along the body towards the center of rotation in that way. Um, and we can vary that value by spin spinning the person around. If we just leave them stationary then at least along the long axis of the body we've got no gravity at all. And as we go faster and faster, we can uh, add more and more and see how it affects the person's uh, ability to judge what's upright while they're lying on their backs. This is what it looks like, going around. You see they've got their head is inside one of these uh, boxes where we've got a screen where we can do the actual experiments. And we can vary gravity from zero through to one G. The people who control the centrifuge like us to have gone much faster. They, they like it when the centrifuge goes around very fast and generates like 10 G. We tried to get, we said we'd like just 0.1 G, just one tenth of a G, please. They were like, oh, we don't know if we can do that. It's just too slow. Anyway, when we did that, we did it at different speeds, therefore different gravities along the long axis of the body. And we found that we needed a certain amount of gravity as a minimum amount before you could actually use it. So here are some planets with their gravity fields. One on the right is our good home Earth there. And the middle one is Mars, which has about 38% of uh, the gravity that we have here on Earth. And the other one is the Moon, which is only about 17%. And the answer is we need about 38%, about 40% or so of the gravity in order to be able to detect it. If we have less gravity than that, if the centrifuge is going around slower than, than it produces that value, then we're just not able to use it. And of course, when we go higher values, everything becomes normal again. <coughs> now this is probably why on the moon, people tend to fall over quite a lot. So here's some pictures of people falling over on the, on the moon. he's upright, look. And now he reaches down for something and uh, clearly he was incorrect in this judgment. So by having such a low gravitational field, you're just not able to use it uh, for proper balancing. Okay, so we've got you grounded in the world uh, by gravity.
gravity determined by an interaction between your vestibular system telling you directly about gravity and the vision that you're seeing in the world uh, and of course your own body that's doing all the actual perceiving and it's the interaction between all these things that's important. Now what we want to be able to do with gravity, you see I, I, I sort of told you that if you lie down on the, on the ground it's like the world's cheapest zero-g simulator because you don't actually have zero uh, gravity along the long axis of the body but of course you do have it in its normal direction. Uh, so what we need to do in order to really uh, look at the effects of gravity is to take it away. And the easiest way to do that uh, is for, 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 um, for vision, the easy way to get rid of that. If you want to know, is vision important for something? You just get the subject to close their eyes, can't do it anymore, must have been vision was very important. But it's much harder to do that for gravity because we're on the Earth. So the only way really to get rid of gravity is to go up into space and cancel it out. Uh, when you're in a, 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 on the uh, space station, it's only a little bit further up from the centre of the Earth than we are. It's only cruising at around 200, 300 kilometres above the Earth, uh, less than the distance to Montreal. So it's not much further um, from the centre of the Earth than we are. But it's going round, and that produces a centrifugal force that cancels the gravity, so that in the space you can uh, work in zero G. So long Earth. We're going up into space now to do some experiments. Uh, so, but now first of all I want to talk about balance. Now what does it even mean to balance in space? We need a measure uh, somehow of, of, of what our sense of balance might be. So here we are doing an experiment. Uh, this was our first experiment uh, done in space. This is in 2014. And here we are at Canada's Mission Control Centre. So you probably didn't know Canada has a Mission Control Centre. <laughs> you know, you think it's always in Houston. But Canada has one too, it's in saint Hubert. Uh, of course it's a little bit indirect, so most of the work is done via Houston, of course you have to go through them to get to, to, get to the astronauts, but here we are doing our, our experiment there, and here's uh, Bob Thirsk, uh, about to do the experiment, and there here he is uh, getting into the uh, equipment and doing some judgments that indicate to us the role of uh, vision. Um, yeah, so what happened when we went up into space? What we found was that you put less emphasis on vision. Less emphasis. That is, it seems on the face of it to be a dumb thing to do. If you take away gravity, then you might expect to put more emphasis on vision to tell you about your gravity because it's all you've got. But what happens is it's because the gravity has been reduced and because they normally work together, it makes sense to reduce the vision as well so that the balance remains the same. So it matches the lack of, of gravity. What was interesting was that it was still present like this a uh, hundred days later, so there was long-term after effects of being, of being in space. We also did the same idea, the same experiment, looking at the importance of vision for people with Parkinson's. And we found that there, uh, there, was, there was more emphasis on vision in that case, which might contribute to why they tend to fall over. Now we're going back into space again. We're doing a new experiment. Um, here we are setting up a, a holder uh, where the uh, astronaut is going to be suspended in the center of the, of the spacecraft so that we can ask them about their sense of movement. Okay, just flip forwards here. Uh, so what we're going to try and do is we're looking at three things. We're looking at uh, whether we can convert visual acceleration into the acceleration of gravity. I've told you that these systems work very closely together. So if we can make the person think that they're accelerating, then perhaps we can get that to uh, interpret it as gravity. We also want to measure how effective you are about moving in space, and whether you can make the correct judgments about your distance, and about the actual perceived distance of objects in space. It was partly inspired because some people took up on Neurolab, they took up a centrifuge, like the one I was just showing you, and they spun a person around, and they wanted to know whether that acceleration would be interpreted as gravity. So here's our person spinning around on this centrifuge in space, and they felt that they were tilted over. That is, they, they felt that the acceleration was actually gravity, so they felt that they were tilted sideways, which of course is a meaningless thing in space. You can't tilt anywhere in space. So we thought we would try that. So we're going to give the, the astronaut this time a, an Oculus Rift. Here we are, nice to do a bit of virtual reality in space. And so now you're going to see what they're going to see. So we're looking into the Oculus Rift, and what you see is a display. First of all, you have to imagine that you're standing on a floorway in, in, in this virtual world. And 
then we're going to move you down a corridor. So there's the corridor. We're going to do it sideways because it's much easier to see if you're tilting sideways left and right than forwards and backwards. So we stay here, they are accelerating along, zoom, 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 zoom. Accelerating as if they're zooming onto the left side of the world. So you hopefully you should feel a little bit that you're moving maybe. It's, a, it's much easier if that's all you can see. And then after they've seen that acceleration, they have to align this with where they think that the floor has changed to. So we're hoping that they'll feel that the floor has tilted and thus indicate to us that they're reinterpreting a gravity. They're getting some sort of reference point that's shifting. Second one is to measure how far they think they've gone. So in the virtual reality again, they're looking down the corridor, and you're, like you are, and what you have to do is that when that target disappears, you're going to move down the corridor, and you're going to tell me, uh, lift your hand when you think you have reached the point where that, where that um, target is. Okay, ready? Here we go. Zoom. Very good, excellent. So now we know how much optic flow, how much visual movement we need to get that distance in space, uh, in, on Earth. And then we have to do it in space as well. Here's another try. Okay. Now, the trouble is, how do we know about distance? So, asking people about how far away something is, is very difficult to do. It's very difficult. How, how far away am I? Something like four meters or something, you can't really say. So we're going to use a trick. We've got a short, in this case, you see, the person sees three lines, but they will all have exactly the same <coughs> retinal image. See on the back. The only way the person could tell if it was a big line or a little line is if they knew how far away it was. So by looking at how big they think the line is, we can estimate how far they think it is away. So they sit there, they get a rod, they have another rod to look at, and they have to simply say whether the rod they're looking at is, uh, is bigger or smaller than the one in their hand. So we can judge how far they think that is. When we do that here in the lab, we can actually run a whole room that's tilted sideways like this, and we find that when they're in that funny position, they actually feel that, this, that the ceiling is closer than it really is. You can actually do this up on your own at home. I was going to get a demonstration, but there's absolutely no time. And you just lie down. Imagine, uh, you just lie on the floor and try and imagine where your head would come up to on the wall. And try and do it where there's no obvious features so you can cheat with it. And you'll notice that you make mistakes. There's that some homework for you. Anyway, in space, it's been thought that there are perceptual problems with distance. So they showed astronauts cubes, and they found that the astronaut needed to make the cube longer in order to appear to be correctly shaped, you know, correct cube, indicating that they misunderstood the distance how far away the back of the cube was relative to the front. But it's a bit indirect. I want to know about actual distances. So here we are giving them this, their pictures, and now they see a, a shape there, a, a little square, and they have to say whether the height of the square is longer or shorter than their own, um, uh, than their own stick that they've got as a reference. Here we have, this is the equipment we needed to take up. We needed to take up a neck brace. But all the rest of the equipment in space was there already. They had the, 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 the Oculus Rift, and the and, all that stuff. and we needed a neck brace because we were asking them to feel that they've tilted their heads and we don't want to actually tilt their heads. Oh my god, can you imagine how difficult it is to get a neck brace that you go and buy from shoppers for $25 into space? <laughs> um, it's, it's like two years of paperwork, they have to set fire to it, they have to melt it, they have, I don't know what they have to do to it. But anyway, we've, been, we've eventually got a nice little neck brace up in space and so we're running the, the experiments. This is the neck brace arriving in its own special container. <laughs> and uh, we're going to measure before, during, and after. And our first subject was David Sanchak, who did this experiment back in December. Here he is arriving in the uh, space uh, capsule, the, uh, the ISS. And here we are at the space center again, a little bit more sophisticated than it was last time. They've got more screens and more data on the walls and stuff. But here he is doing the experiment. This is Christina Koch, who did this experiment just last week, and she's just putting the helmet on to show you what she's doing. And there's the stick, you see, that she's using to judge the, the distances. So we're hoping that we can create visual gravity in space, that we can measure perceptual, perceptually how far you think you've, you've gone, how fast you go, um, how, whether distances seem to be longer or shorter, the whole package. And that will all fit into a model to explain how gravity affects uh, our ability to perceive self-motion, orientation, and distance here on Earth. And the reason that we need to do that is because we are here on Earth. 
We're, 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 we're moving around all the time. Look at the optic flow here, you see. And you really need to be able to make those sorts of judgments in order to not hit that car in front that we're just going up toward. You need, you need to make these judgments. So one of the uh, things that we're hoping to will be coming out of this experiment is an understanding of how we move around under normal circumstances and how it uh, gets damaged in certain cases. I mentioned Parkinson's to you as, a, as one of the issues that uh, uh, where they have problems in balance and in the orientation. And so we're certainly going to be looking at that. So in conclusion, we are all prisoners of, of gravity. But if we understand that and we know how it works, then we're able to use this to our, uh, to our advantage. Water is unknown to a fish until it understands air, until it meets air. And in some ways, gravity is unknown to us until we go into space. Thank you. Skydiving as a, as a way of cancelling gravity. If you jump out of an aeroplane, you will be in free fall. 
So at that point, you will be accelerating downwards at G. And that means that you're in balance. So you are, in fact, in zero G for that little period of time. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are on the planet. Any, the gravitational field over the, over the surface of the Earth only varies by a very small number of percent. It's just the, it's a, so that's not the point. The point is that you're falling. You're falling. You're in free fall. You're balancing gravity. So you would, indeed, be at zero G. The problem is two things. Number one, you have air. And air is, is, is resistant. So you eventually reach a point where the air force pressing up is equal to your force coming down. And that produces what's called terminal velocity at about, um, I think it's about 110 miles an hour, something like that. So until you reach that point, you're in free fall. But it only takes you about two minutes to hit that point. And then, of course, you'll go down at, at peak speed. And then you hit the next problem, which, of course, is the, is the ground. <laughs> so you can generate a small amount of zero G. Uh, and it's fun, people pay a lot of money to be able to do that, um, but it's not really a very valid um, uh, scientific method. What we can do is free fall inside an aeroplane. So you can take an a, a a aeroplane and fly it in a certain pattern so that it cancels out the, the force of gravity. It's limited because you can only go so high in an aeroplane before the aeroplane doesn't work, and you can only go so down before the aeroplane definitely doesn't work. You've got sort of a range in that you can go in. And it turns out you can create about 23 seconds, 22, 23 seconds of gravity, anti of zero gravity in that, in that period of time. So that's, uh, scientifically, we can look at that, but only very short periods. And the trouble is you're looking basically at the transition in and then the transition out of the time. You, in order to get stable periods of zero gravity, the only solution is to be in orbit around the Earth. Yeah. And in terms of what the astronauts experience with their vision on a spaceship, does that have to do simply with the distance to things? Do they, would they, without training, misjudge the distance, or are there other issues as well? Well, they're, they're, okay, the question is whether um, vision might be affected by being in space in, in many different ways. What we're doing in our experiments is looking at their perceptual uh, abilities to do things like judging distance and so forth. Um, uh, those, those, are, those should not be affected directly by being in space. We just put your head in a vacuum. There's no reason why it should do that, that particular thing. But um, it's, with, there are issues about being in low gravity for a long period of time that have been thought to have some uh, repercussions on ocular health. So, for example, um, when you're standing here, when I'm standing here, my heart is pushing uh, blood up faster with more pressure than when it's moving in the other direction. See, because it's fighting gravity. But if you stand on your head, you know this because the blood goes to your head and you. And in space, that's what happens. So the blood goes to the head because the heart is pumping too hard this way. And it takes a little bit of time to uh, adjust. But in general, that's always going to be the case. So your head is going to be at a higher pressure than it normally is. And this is, is, has been shown to have some sort of damage occasionally to the eyes. Um, it usually recovers. And it's usually minor, uh, like you need to wear glasses or something for a short period of time. And then you don't need to wear them when you come back down. But there have been some uh, more complex issues. buoyancy, 
you're cancelling out the pressure on your feet, pressure on everything, your balance. So there's no somatosensory cues, no touch cues that tell you about your orientation. So it turns out to be a good environment for a good, a good laboratory environment for measuring just the vestibular system on its own without all these other senses. You see, so it's a, it's useful to do that. Um, but that just describes what, what 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 did you want to know about being underwater? Well, so you're still experiencing your body, still experiencing your same amount of gravity, you just don't physically feel it, you're yeah, yeah, that's basically it. It's still, you're still experiencing gravity, and you can point upwards, usually, usually. Sometimes you can get mistaken, because it's a much smaller force now. You don't now have the full touch forces as well. Um, and in fact, if you've got damage to your vestibular ear, the vestibular system in your ear, uh, one of the things they tell you is don't swim underwater. It's a, like, it's a very dangerous thing to do, because you get underwater, and you literally do not know which way is up. And so you sometimes people have swum to the bottom thinking they're going to the surface and, and drown of course accordingly. So it's a, it's a, that's one of the things. Well, um, the question period has come to an end. And on behalf of Cramp, we want to thank you for your time and for the presentation. Let's give him an applause.